Hello, welcome to the meeting 10. Once again, we're discussing the work of Stan Tenen, Research Director of the Meru Foundation. Before we get started, I want to introduce our usual cast of characters, Levana Tenen, Michael Andron, Adele Packer, and Daniel Gill, who I'm happy to see today. So we're going to continue what we did on our last episode. If you didn't see it, we have a website called extremekabbalah.org and .com. It works with both, in which we have short snippets of videos that were done in the past of Stan. Uh, each one has a topic, a name. And so we're asking everyone to choose one. And we're going to discuss the topic. Again, it's uh, extremekabbalah.org com or dot org if you want to go there and see all the different options we have and again these are little two to three minute snippets but on our last uh, program we were able to uh, garner quite a discussion on each one of them before we do that however i want to play the theme music that we used uh on each one of these it is quite a kind of repetitious if you're watching all of them you have to you hear the music every time. And so uh, I'm just going to choose one and let's play the theme and then we're going to discuss it. I guess I should just start out by saying, um, let's just hear it. If you go to our videos, you'll you'll hear that music quite a bit. I used it a lot on, on the videos. I thought it was really compelling and it uh, definitely fit the, the, you know, the genre of the, of the topic or, or the research. Um, so the, uh, the music was composed by Stephen James Taylor, Afri African-American film composers, done a wide range of films over the years. Um, he somehow, and, and Lavana, maybe you can fill us in on how you get, how you met Stephen and how this all came about. One of Stanley's earliest ways of trying to explore whether or not there was a pattern or, uh, in the introduction of the letters, uh, the Hebrew letters of Genesis. Uh, one of the first things he did way before I met him, actually, was to uh, sign each letter a note, and he, he just was using the regular scale like you find on a piano, um, and have a friend of his who was a musician play it out and see what she thought. Well, okay, that was interesting. Um, and the uh, his idea was that in a large body of data, we humans are better wired to hear patterning than we are to see it, to hear structure than we are to see it, if you're dealing with a large body of data in particular, uh, which the text of Genesis certainly is. Um, we had done uh, on our little Commodore 64, uh, a, uh, uh, actually had put together a file which would play out the first 2,209, I think it is, letters of the text, which basically takes it up to the introduction of the first psalmic. Uh, which is way, way out of place. It's in the middle of the story of the Garden of Eden, um, or like right before that anyway. And it was intriguing, um, but it wasn't anything that we felt we could, you know, like do much more with than we already had. 
so he was asking and soliciting, you know, saying, hey, if you're a musician, if you're curious about this, you know, find some system, uh, assign the notes, you know, assign the letters each notes and, you know, see what you can do with it. We got dozens of attempts, which like didn't make any oral sense, which were like off the target, which like didn't, you know, people kind of took off in their own directions and they didn't actually do something that was as systematic as we wanted. Or if they did, it like didn't sound any more like music than just the straight notes did. And then I, I honestly forget how we first met him, but we encountered Stephen James Taylor, who is, um, his professional career is yes, Hollywood films, TV, um, and he's actually uh, multiracial, not not just uh, not just African American. Um, he is, has a lot of different traditions in his family, but he is also was also known in the music community as a composer who specialized in some in microtonal composing. Um, and what he did was to take and and use a scale that was based in some way and unfortunately i i don't grasp the details of it on a pythagorean scale and um then he chose instruments to use i think it was four different instruments to use to that on the midis available at that time reflected instruments um, that were mentioned in in uh, the Torah text. Um, and what I do remember is, so there was a, a series of talks that we gave down in the LA area. And one of them um, was at Taylor's home. And he played this music for us and I got chills because for the first time someone had made something from our criteria and added his own criteria in terms of the Pythagorean scale and the, the instruments and how many of which he used that made sense in terms of the kinds of structures that we thought were possibly a part of this. And it sounded like music first time um and as i say i got chills when we did it he was kind and has been kind enough to allow us to use this music as we see fit you know without um owing him residuals on it which was just wonderful for a professional to do um we've lost touch with him over the decades but nonetheless are still very grateful um both for his efforts and uh, for his generosity. And you can listen to it. Um, there is a version of it which is short and there's a version of it which is extended. Um, and uh, that's basically the story behind it. The closing credits tend to go on longer than the opening credits so you can hear more of it that way yeah and the and the closing credits is a slower version than yeah. the opening credits uh mm -hmm. both very compelling i talked to him maybe 10 years ago i don't remember why i called him but he, he was very gracious uh he said yeah you can, guys can use it if it starts making money <laughs> let me know uh but i'm sure he doesn't need it if you go to im imdb you'll see uh, a, quite a list of credits, and he's still doing it. So uh, he's a very, very successful composer. Um, so again, uh, listen, to, you'll hear the music quite a bit uh, on each one of these clips every time we play it. So let me put up, um, let me put up the page. All right, so I'm going to go through these again. This is the uh, website, and uh, we'll go through it. And I'll mention the ones that we did last time. So the first one we did, all letters are from Yud. Beyond Babel, the gesture alphabet of Genesis, Bible codes, 
biblical literal, liz, literalism, Bible math, finding geometry in Genesis, frame, framing may research we did last time, Genesis in base three, the Genesis Taurus, Genesis is woven, the hand of Genesis, Hebrew, Greek, Arabic letters from Genesis. We did Hebrew I into Tav, Hebrew flame letters, the letter bait, letter text of Genesis as creation, literal meaning in the Bible, the logic and hierarchy of Genesis, the meditation in Genesis, mind hand world, modeling Genesis, the letters of Genesis and natural unfurlment, self-reference in Genesis and the alphabet, solving Babel, universal gesture language, the first words of Genesis and the Bible codes, Toku Kavaro, the hand unifies mind and world. We did Torah and Pi, the tree of life, vortex flame letters, the God of Abraham, the meditation in Genesis, geometric metaphor in Torah and Torah universal constant. So I'm gonna ask once again uh, for each of you to, uh, to choose one. I'll give you a few minutes to decide. You might wanna, I don't think we'll have time to do more than one each, <laughs> but uh, if we do, then I'll I'll put it uh, put it back up again. Uh, so I'll start with you, Lavana. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your choice? Uh, Toku Kavaro. The issue here is to make yourself like the model. Well, how do you make yourself like the model? Well, the model is really interesting. This hand model connects this inside to this outside. It unifies them in the hand, in one unity. In the Talmud, which is the written version of the oral companion to the written Hebrew Bible, which is not accepted by anything but but Jewish tradition, but nevertheless goes back about 2,000 years also. Um, it's taught, there's a phrase for a person of integrity. They're said to be toku kavaro. Toku is like our word take. It means take in. And kavaro is like our word bara from here, creation. Bereshit, to project out, to create. A person who is toku kavaro, whose inside is like their outside, is morally transparent. Whether it's a righteous person, a tzaddik, or a saint, Mother Teresa type, it's someone who's morally transparent. Their inside and their outside are the same. That's the, really the only qualification for doing this work or learning these ideas. It looks like a lot of mathematics, but the mathematics is only the spreadsheet. It's only the lattice for holding the information together and keeping it in a way that you can use it. The math by itself is sterile. It's only if we emulate the feelings that are being cataloged by the math, that this can come alive and that we can deeply understand it. We can hear it inside, not just superficially, not just outside. You know, anybody have any comments on that? On that? I, I, I have to chuckle because um, we're recording this on the day of the last of the hearings of the January 6th committee in the House. And, you know, uh, what is a person of integrity is kind of right in the back of my mind at this point, at this point. Um, and so it just seems, um, I had no idea other than that. I, I know what the topic is of how right on point, what Stanley was going to say is in that little video clip. Um, sometimes the universe is amazingly, um, corresponding to itself. And that's my comment for the moment. <laughs> I know that um, when we, you know, proceeded with this work and we were trying to get support and talking to people and people would come along and they'd want to take it a different direction or they wanted to use it for their own purposes. The bottom line for Stan was always the integrity of the work. He used that term a lot. And and that's something that we're we, you know we're, we have to maintain, uh, and there are different various ways to do that in this versus different frameworks we can we can do that in. So that that was and, and you could see it in his personal demeanor that in terms of talking to people, in terms of presenting it, in terms of deciding how to accept, you know things in or gifts or whatever people wanted, uh, it was always 
an essential part of of uh, his demeanor. Adele, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, it's just just like you say, the universe is lining up. Um, I've been studying uh, the Parsha uh, of Noah because I have to do a presentation, which is coming up October 24th. So um, I've been doing a lot of you know reading commentary, and Safada Met had a lot to say about the tzaddik and the you know what is a righteous person, and what became clear is that there were when when it's Noah Noah his name is said twice and when a name is said twice it is talking about the complete person that you can be a tzaddik by doing righteous acts or acts of kindness because of a kind of heartfelt empathy and emotional response to something and you can also be a righteous person by using your intellect like following the observances or say well, this is right because this is what i've learned to do is right and that is also righteous, but to be a complete person, you need both. And the way he described righteousness from the inside and the outside, it's like from the heart and from the mind. Um, I found myself looking back on what he had to say, and I am going to um, definitely quote him in my um, presentation. And in fact, I quickly grabbed it when you picked that particular concept and i just want to read you one thing which is that um this comes right out of things that i've read or heard from his lectures that noah's ark is that bet it's that bet from the inside and the outside it's a container it's it was open to the top and the sides but it it had inside and outside and um that it housed Noah and his family and all the pairs of creatures. And those on the inside are distinguished from what is happening on the outside. So on the inside, there is this, it had its own chaos and safety, but on the outside, it's raining and raining and um, the wor world is being destroyed. Um, so there are these two parallel stories, what's happening on the inside of the bet and what's happening on the outside. And, um, and then I, said the ark is a metaphor for the distinction between our innermost feelings within the ark and what we show to the outside world, the outside of the ark. Noah is referred to as a tzaddik known for his loving kindness. Stan Tenen said, in the Talmud, tzaddiks are said to have a quality of integrity, to be toku kavaro. Their insides are like their outsides. The love of the tzaddik is the identity of beauty and truth. It is as though they have no skin. They are not hiding anything. Everything flows freely. And in that clip, he said they are transparent. So I just love that I was able to pull in Stan's wisdom as I was making some sense out of this simple story in the Torah. So I wanted to share that. And, and by the way, um... <laughs> Just as another uh, example of the world's aligning, um, if you are familiar with Jewish life cycles, you will know that um, when a boy reaches 13, he's bar mitzvah, and traditionally, they had the whatever section of the Torah is being read at that time when they turn 13. That's called their Parsha, you know, and Stanley's Parsha was Noah. Oh. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty cool. Thank you for yeah, telling Yeah, it's very that. cool. I had no idea yeah. that, you know, anyway. Yeah, that's very I guess cool. it's that kind of day. <laughs> <laughs> now, you yeah. notice when Stan was talking, he's holding up the model, he pointed to the tip as inside and the top as outside. So the model was representative of that idea and is another example of how it's more than just a hand model um, and what it represents. Um, I was talking to somebody recently who, you know, and talking about our plans that we'd like to, to you know, create this hand model for, for uh, public distribution. 
and he was saying, well, wouldn't it, if you really presented it like that, wouldn't it seem like a, a, um, a, a false idol, like an idol of some sort, graven image? I said, well, first of all, no, it's a hand. It's not an idol. And also it represents movement. And that's something that we have to keep remembering. And Stan said that in one of his presentations, none of this, these aren't things, none of this stuff is static. It's all based on movement and energy. Uh, and, and so whenever you see him making these presentations, it's important to keep that in mind because that's the way he saw it. If you look in the book and you see the graphics, nothing is static. It looks 2, 2D, but it's really 3D, 4D, 5D, and, and hence it needs to be animated. <laughs> so um, any other comments on that piece that we just saw? Yes, Daniel. Yeah, it's it's you know it's um, as someone who spent a lot of time in the Talmud, uh, uh, I actually studied the the dispute that arose because of Toho Kavaro. Uh, so it's you know the phrase has come to mean something thousands of years later that the original incident kind of meant the exact opposite, um, and it has to do with democracy actually. So. The rabbis had a system of uh, voting, and um, they would vote on the law. They would discuss the laws, and then they would take a vote. And you were encouraged to uh, obviously then keep the communal standard, whatever the vote was. Uh, Rabbi Gamliel had the idea that not only were you required to keep the communal standard, you weren't allowed to think differently. Hmm. You weren't, and he didn't want to preserve the minority opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, and he called that Toho Kavara. Hmm. The inside had to match the outside. So it was kind of in its inception was fascist, really. <laughs> um, and, and because Ju Judaism is inherently anti-fascist, actually, uh, despite what someone might tell you, uh, Rabbi Gamliel was deposed publicly. And even though he was an elder and very well respected, he was replaced with an 18 year old, hmm. Rabbi Elazar Ben Azaria, who said, your inside doesn't have to match your outside. We're gonna preserve, uh, we're gonna preserve minority opinions and everyone's welcome. And many parts of the Talmud, very, very important things come out of him allowing in diverging opinions from the communal standard and discussing them. And as a matter of fact, it's kind of seen as the essential part of the Talmud in preserving uh, divergent opinions and, and keeping a culture of diverse thought within strict communal adherence. Uh, but over the years, uh, Toho Kavaro has become something other than what Reverend Gamliel meant it to be, which is uh, having integrity. And so it's it's a very it's a very interesting if you look at how concepts flow over thousands of years, you can trace this concept. And what's fascinating is uh, what's going on, what you mentioned in Congress. I mean, it has directly to do with, you know, the thought police or whatever, you know. Um, and uh, but there's there's a story about uh, during this time, there's a couple of very cool stories. I think Rabbi Akiva especially. So they wouldn't let him in. And he, because uh, he wouldn't adhere to this. So what he did was he he actually went on the roof and was listening from the skylight, right? And uh, the next morning, they noticed that the sun wasn't out. Like, what's going on? Like, something's covering the skylight. And so they went up, and there's Rabbi Akiva, like, you know, passed out, like, exhausted, like, from well, staying there. Half, half frozen also. Yeah, he was really cold, and they brought him in. And so then they said, okay, so he, ha he has Toko Kavaro, meaning he has that... Uh, oh, right. that drive to to overcome his outside from inside. So it's, it's from because of Rabbi Akiva actually that that the entire incident, that the phrase actually has a uh, a positive connotation that then gets passed on. In yeah, addition, I'm, to, yeah, I'm glad anyway. you said that because Stan used yeah. Rabbi Akiva uh, as an example of Toku Kavaro. Yeah. In an unfortunate example, meaning the way he was, uh, the way he died. Yeah, um, and sure. the Romans tortured him, scaled his skin, and the letters came out, and he he was thankful of that, 
unbelievably. Uh, yeah. But again, it was it was an example of uh, it, it's definitely uh, directly connected to Rabbi Akiva. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, Daniel, why don't you go next um, and choose one of these? Uh, how about the meditation in Genesis? Okay. <laughs> I noticed yeah. I have. <laughs> Is that the one? Well, that's the one I picked. You have it there twice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I noticed I, pick, I can pick a different one. That's cool. No, no, no. It's okay. You look a little younger than I am, but I remember the 1950s. They had these Dr. Murray dance studios. And what they would do is they'd teach you to do the waltz or the cha-cha. They'd literally paint um, footprints on the ballroom floor. And you'd step into the with footprints until you stumbled. But you'd learn to do the waltz. The letters are like footprints in your mind. If you can do the exercise, you will have the experience. Spiritual experience is ineffable. You can't describe it in words. So a sacred text that's just a story can only tell you that some prophet might have existed and might have had an experience, but what he experienced, who knows? But a text that's a formal language, a language that specifies motion, not only motion of your hands or a dance outside, but a motion you can also see, feel, that's a yoga. You, you follow that path and do that dance and your consciousness will change. Well, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> Um, I love that Arthur Murray reference. I mean, nobody knows what that is. <laughs> you know, I remember uh, that. It, yeah, well, just just to reiterate what Stan was talking about, literally, that's how people learn to dance. They put this, and I never went to one, so I'm going by what I heard also. <laughs> but that's how you learn the cha cha or the foxtrot or whatever was going around those days. But what about that? Uh, what about that idea of doing that in your mind because obviously that makes the most sense okay yeah look uh you know i mean one of the he mentioned even in the previous video the concept of you know the underlying emotions which the mathematic with the mathematics kind of hold or describe um i think that's that's uh you know i think one of the things one of the ways to Kind of peer inwards into the work of Meru is to look at how these letters. There's a lot of technical and beautiful information, but the 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 kind of ikar, the main point, the essence of it is to try to get to the emotions that underlie the meditate, underlie the letters, and then using texts to try to learn these emotional dances uh in your heart and mind and I, I you know i remember a conversation with stan about that as being kind of the whole the whole uh point and this gets back to his vision of having a minion and and coordinating these and getting to a place where there are emergent qualities uh, which he believed i think were associated with god's name the the uh, four-letter name of god yud hey vav and then a hey uh, meaning the, the God, the, the Elohim is kind of like gods or the gods or godliness around us kind of in nature. Uh, but Hashem, as, as we say, or the Tetragrammaton, uh, the Yud, He, and the Vav, and the He, uh, is the emergent quality when we learn to let go of our ego. One of the things that's inter interesting as a musician is that, you know, uh, music can have a tremendously technical quality to it, but um, there's a grave <laughs> difference between someone who plays something technically well and then someone who plays with their whole heart. And off, and those can be sometimes mutually exclusive. And obviously, a combination of the two is the best. But, but you know, if I'm going to listen, you know, I remember, I've been to symphony concerts where I fall asleep just because it's it's perfect, but it's completely boring. <laughs> uh, and you know, and I've been to folk concerts where the music is like, I mean, honestly, pretty simple, you know, pretty boring music, but the 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 emotion and the intensity of the performer 
it's just mind blowing. And so I think it's important to, you know, there can be a way in, in which intellectualism can, can mask or hide our ability to explore our emotions. And I think it's important to remember that Stan didn't want that, <laughs> you know, he was, he was trying to get us to get to pure emotion, uh, but in a way that's kosher and, and helpful for the world. I, I, emotion um, within a structured, uh, within a structure of whatever, uh, a structure that promotes integrity, I'm not finding the words. Um, both were actually important to him mm. as a person who he natively was a lot easier and more comfortable exp you know, expressing things through his intellect than necessarily through his heart in, unless he knew you, you know, and that yeah. obviously changed um, as he lived longer and learned more. Um, but I know that particularly when it comes to the book or even some of particularly the earlier and earliest videos, people go, well, you know, I just can't follow this. And to some degree, that's because his ability to integrate both of those things um, increased over time, grew over mm. time, um, and so that, that uh, towards the end of his life and career, he was much more able to express both in tune with one another. But there aren't many videos of that. So honestly, right. those of you who are watching, who are going through the videos, um, just trust me that, that, that there was an integration, you know, and that the heart was equally as important to him and ultimately central um, he, he, the one of the the messages that he tried to give those people he did talk to uh, towards the end of his life the last several years just basically boiled down to the golden rule be generous say yes um, mm. very much coming to the conclusion that the basis that that was the basis of everything through all of the intellectual and structured way he tended to think that even that structured way of thinking ultimately led to the golden rule yeah i mean it, it's it's a phenomenal thing because um y you know the he went through he used his you know, clearly God-given talents of his mind, which were extraordinary, uh, to bring into this world this, this, this hand model, which is so, in a way, so basic, you know, and you, you don't need to know anything to use it. You just have to do the gestures. And I think that's where the magic kind of comes in, you know, and I just, uh, if you know, anyone listening, I, you know, we, you know, it's very important we get the hand model printed and we start getting people to use it because it's, it's just so special and, and, and it really does open your heart up, you know, and so it's a real, it's a gift he gave to the world, you know, Definitely. such a gift. You know, one other thing that he pointed to, it was kind of an aside in this last clip, uh, he talked about the prophets and how they did their prophecy, most likely based on his theory, that they were turning these things over in, in a logical path in their in their mind. Now, what do we have? We have English, well, depending on what language you're reading it, but we have translations in the Tanakh, in the Bible, of the prophets, and most people read them, and they're pretty pretty meaningless. I mean, it's you're looking at it as history. Of predicting what will happen to the Israelites or the Jewish people because they're turning away from God, or you know it was either good news or bad news. Um, but obviously, there's got to be more to it than what we're reading. Uh, one of the things that Stan brought us was this idea of looking at the Torah and the Bible with a different set of eyes, and 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 trying to peer through. Now, you know, we're not at anywhere near that level of getting into the 
Hebrew letters that perhaps wrote that. And this isn't part of the Torah. This is this is later on. And it is, unlike the Torah, considered history. But um, this idea of religion and Judaism and, and uh, how it developed, I think, is a lot different than we're seeing it today and, and what was going on back then and what these prophets were actually saying and doing and how they were doing it. And I think that would be a, an interesting path to explore at some point. Um, I, I find it very, very interesting. Well, uh, we know music was involved with prophecy also. That's right. Um, so it's interesting, you know, some combination of focusing on the letters and the music. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any more comments on that clip? Yes. Yeah. My um, the statement you just made a moment ago, Bill, uh, got me thinking when you said Stan was talking about seeing by using a different set of eyes. Mm -hmm. He was probably more talking about seeing by using a different set of hands. Um, you know, we have at, at Mount Sinai, seeing the sounds, you know, hear the colors, see the music. Um, a whole that state of synesthesia, which for the medical people say, oh, there's something wrong with your brain, you know, your wiring's off. But to people who have spent time in meditation and mystical pursuits, uh, the idea that we see beyond the normal range of seeing, seeing sounds um, is, I guess, clairvoyance, if you used it that way, hearing the chauffeur is hearing things differently and hearing things within the sound itself and um, even sensing something different uh, to sense something uh, which is not only feeling which can be done with the hands but also a feeling in the heart mm -hmm. and all of those are hinted at by the different holidays that we celebrate um, to make two connections from where we started at the beginning. Um, you know, how synchronicity kind of works out that you're working on Noah, uh, Adele, and, and uh, that was his Parsha and so on. Um, and finding something inside that's outside. The Hebrew word for the ark is teva, uh, which is also a syllable. Uh, it's a sound. Okay, but it's an interesting word because it's tough, yud, bet, hey. I reached back a few minutes ago to check my dictionary on the spelling to make sure I was right. But bet is our letter for multiplicity, as is tet, as is tough, the last letter in the 22 letters. It represents the whole as opposed to olive being one, tough is everybody, 400. And yet the word itself of the ark has a yud and a hey couched between the letters of, of multiplicity are the two of the four letters of God's name, uh, which really only has three because there are two hey's. So it's got a yud and a hey. It's as if we're sort of blending and looking for something that's hidden there knowing that it's hidden, knowing that there's a spark of divinity inside to then find it. I heard this amazing thing. Again, this is synchronicity. We're now in the holiday of Sukkot, uh, as well as the January 6th hearing, but uh, we're in the middle of Sukkot. And we wave the four species, the Lula, the Etrog, the Hadassim, and the Aravot. And each one has different symbolism. You can look at the shape of what it is and say, oh, it's the heart, it's the spine, it's the eyes, it's the mouth. And there are all kinds of commentaries on it. And I heard one that blew me away, which is exactly what you said, Bill, when you talked about the point of the hand model mm -hmm. and then the expression of the hand model, like this is the point inside. And what he was saying was, there's an outside. So if you're starting on the inside, get to the outside. If you're starting on the outside, get to the inside. It's, it's a journey. You start with, and this is, I, I just heard this uh, a day or so ago, and I thought it was amazing. The, they say, if you start with the yet rogue, that's the fruit. 
of a tree. And it says a fruit of a beautiful, a, a fruit of a beautiful tree. And the next thing you have is the lulav. And the lulav is actually a leaf. It's not a stalk. It's a leaf. Because if you look at a palm tree, before it breaks out into the branches, there's a lulav at the top of it. It's nothing but a leaf. So you're starting with the fruit, then you go to a leaf, then you go to a thick branch. It's got to be thick. That's the way it's described in, in the book of Leviticus. It's a thick branch. And then you go to a branch that grows near water, near, near the river. And you're going to the source. You're going from the fruit and you will find happiness. You're supposed to celebrate on Sukkot. It's a festival of happiness. Isn't that the same thing for a person who didn't search? Eve, she took the fruit and what came out about as a result of getting the fruit but not looking where it came from? Because ultimately the fruit came from the leaves, came from the branch, came from the tree which rooted to the earth and brought forth what does that bring you to? Where does the water come from? From God. God set it up. So it's a journey to get to God. It's from the point to the expression of it. What did Eve not do? She just took the fruit and said, hey, taste this fruit. And it's almost the same words used in Genesis as are used in Leviticus. The difference being that they weren't looking for the depth, for the spark inside. They weren't following that journey which is exactly what the hand model, if you just put it on the table, don't even put it on your hand, just sit it on the table and you see exactly the same thing. You see there's a point and there's an expression. Same as the ark, same as the etrog and lulav, because it's going to God, it gets you joyousness. If you get it, if you only look at the fruit, the final expression and you don't recognize where it's coming from, and a deeper source, then what have you got? You have sadness. The woman will bear children in pain. The men will, you know, uh, plow the fields in, in by the sweat of their brow and so on. It's, it's one big message and it's a message of that love, of that don't do that which is hateful. Go back to the source, go back to the core of it. So, Thanks for holding up the model, Lavana. I mean, we keep talking about yes. it. And, uh, you know, we, we should have it on the screen the whole time, but uh, it's just so elegant and beautiful. So we, we do need to keep coming back to it because we talk to it. Um, I mean, that, that one is Talk really, to it in addition to talking about it, I guess. Is that, that's really a good one. That, that's really, it's, it's probably, pretty good. It's one of the better ones. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on because I don't want to run out of time here. Uh, Adele, um, uh, have your see. choice. <laughs> uh, did we do the letter bet to hear what he has to say about uh, it? No, I don't think we well, did. Then let's do that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly this guy. This is the letter bet, bait. It's the first letter of the text of Genesis. It's the one translated in the. Its formal meaning is house. But God's not a noun, God's a verb. In Hebrew is a real mode language. That means the primary roots are verbs, not nouns. So it's not a house, it's housing. It's what a house does. We've talked about this a lot. Um, it's, it, 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 you know, and, and he's talked about this in other programs too, and, you know, basically said everything revolves around this concept of the letter bait, inside, outside. Yeah, I'll just um, add one thought that really has to do with our last discussion, um, where we were talking about the emotions versus the intellect and how the integrity of both you know, is really the quality of the complete righteous one. And, um, and then Daniel mentioned uh, the technicality of writing music or performing music is 
just something's missing if it doesn't also get to the level of the heart of what am I saying with this music? And um, I was just thinking the parallel is identical with dance. Um, I'm choreographing something now where we just have to get the technical part of what are the moves and then we're starting to add where is the breath and suddenly the thing is opening in a different way and then we're adding you know what is it you want to say from the inside of you as you make this movement and so then the technical parts you know that foundation is laid and then we can really make something that's meaningful um, so structure all by itself you know, even that gorgeous sculpture of the hand just sitting on a table is beautiful. But when you start to see like how it was derived and what it can say and how it can move with each letter, it's like suddenly the layers and layers of the emotional response within as you start to move with that piece is very different than looking at it, which is still beautiful as a sculpture. It's just like, these sort of extremes of just a structure or just the emotions um, and then how you start to form something that's a true expression. So yeah, it all starts with that. There is a concept, another concept in um, Hasidus, which Stanley relied on, you know, for many, many years which is that the idea is that um, the flame and the coal and, you know, basically where he took it was the idea of, okay, if you have a, have a flame, but it's not contained, then you're going to burn down the barn. If you've got a container, but you don't have a flame in it, then you're not going to get any light. That in order to have this be productive, life-giving, go somewhere, you need both the flame, the heart, and the coal, the meaning, the structure, um, how to, you know, it's basically, I mean, the phrase, you know, people who are burnouts, well, they have allowed, for whatever reason, um, their flame, their feelings to just take over and then you burn out and you're gone. Um, flame and structure, flame and container, flame and coal, both are necessary um, in order to, as I say, be productive of something that's real and growing. So that, Adele, you reminded me of, you know, of the centrality of that concept. You know, it's, I have to say that like a lot of these concepts are like applicable in many disciplines. So, you know, um, I was looking back at some notes. I'm trying to reorganize uh, whatever. I'm doing all sorts of things. I was looking back at notes on my my first string quartet, which was not dedicated to Stan, but what I what I this my second string quartet is dedicated to Stan's memory, um, and you should check it out. It's really good. Um, but the first one was just was uh, was about peacemaking, but the I, I forgot about it, but I used the structure of archetypal, spiritual and physical as a model of how to write. Mm -hmm. And I had mapped that out as a as a methodology in terms of how I was going to write that my first string quartet. And I had written there the Ik Bakar, the, the whole, you know, the thing and I wrote it out. And I had as, as, if, as an example, I had um, composer. Uh, universal mind as archetypal, mm -hmm. the players playing the music as spiritual, and the audience as the entire experience as the physical embodiment. Mm. And uh, it really worked uh, in terms of writing that piece. And it's a real, so just an example like these ideas are incredible in what they're doing, but they're also amazing in terms of like you can they're so applicable and so beautifully laid out that that they can be a real aid and like a multi multi discipline you know uh, we'll put a link down below to those uh pieces um so any you guys should definitely listen to uh to daniel's work it's really amazing uh, yeah okay. um dan's use of the word and and adele too talking about emotion 
got me thinking about the word emotion, which is a word of motion. It's a movement from or to a place. Like if we're in a nice, quiet, calm place and we get emotional, we are moving away from that calm place. Or if we're in a crazy place and we're moving back in, it's moving away or out from, because E is, is short for X. But if you think of it not as E as X, as in going out, the motion reflecting out, but also as equals MC squared. It's energy and mass. It's the spirit and the feeling as well as the mass that kind of work. It, it's we're going back and forth from those two worlds. It's like back and forth and back and forth um, from from the physical to the emotional to the heartful. I think maybe a more applicable word. Sometimes we think of emotional as mostly the negative stuff, but it's not just it's, it's a feeling. It's a heartful. Uh, thing when when you watch, um, uh, and we had the clip uh, a couple of weeks ago of Adele's dance in one of the clips, and um, and listen to the music, you hear, you're moved by it, you're touched by it, and as you said, it could be a folk singer in the '60s with four chords on his guitar, but he's <laughs> the idea is profound, and you are your heart is touched by it. And vice versa, you can fall asleep during <laughs> something that may be touched, very complex. Your heart is touched by the folk singer because their heart is touched by what they're trying to convey. Right. So their inside is going outside mm -hmm. and it's going outside to your inside. It's coming inside. Yeah. 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 Transmission. And if you pay attention yeah, heart to, heart. to your body as you listen to these things, you can feel your body's response. That's right. You know, and, and that's a, an awareness that most of us in the modern world have kind of shut off in part out of necessity. But um, if you go to a concert that starts to move you, if you see a dance performance that makes you catch your breath, um, pay attention to your body, pay attention to your physical responses. It will take you to another space yeah, it, as, as you're watching someone else give you what they have to give. And it can come in any art form. It can be a painting, it can be a movie, it can, you know, so that's what art is basically, that transmission from the artist to the person from inside to inside, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna say one more thing about the letter bait. Uh, Stan did say this a number of times uh, he quoted, I don't remember who he quoted, and maybe Daniel, you know this, that the secret of the universe can be found in the first letter of Genesis, of Rashi. But if you can't find it there, God is an infinite mercy, gives it to you in the first word. And it, uh, if it's not there, it's in the first verse, and it's not there, it goes on and on. He called it a hierarchical array. In fact, I think it's one of these topics, and I can play that also. Um, but we've talked about bait quite a bit, and we know about the first verse. Um, but what about the first word? So I'm going to choose my topic here because I think this is where he um, he talks about the first word of Genesis. Oh, here it is. Okay. It's called Genesis is Woven. So we're dealing with a text that is coded at the letter level, letter by letter by letter. That's very important because most people think that the text of the Bible, of the Torah, is a story. Um, it's a rare story indeed where the sequence of letters makes the words, which then have to be made into a story. The other one. Um, uh, basically, what he talks about is probably one of the other. Uh, uh, are we back? Did I? Yes. Stop? Yeah. Back. Um, is where he talks about. Uh, first of all, there's I don't know how many translations of the first verse of Rashi. 
he talks about. There's 700 or some odd number like that. But he talks about the first word as being, um, he called it a, a woven network. He, he uses the reshet, I think, as the, the letters, the root letters that describes the fact that it's, it's a woven, it's a weaving. And he compared it to a Navajo rub where there, where there's skip patterns. And that was necessary to, to protect the Torah so it wouldn't be usurped. Obviously it wasn't written. Anybody could just steal a written, but if it was woven with skip patterns, then only people who know knew how to interpret that in future generations could unweave it. And that's what he did. And, and it's been hidden for all these hundreds of years. Nobody's known to do that. Nobody has uh, thought about the fact that that's a possibility, that it's not just written in literal words, that of course it's woven. I mean, weaving was a technology of the ancient world. And so, um, you know, that's the perspective we've got, we've got to walk away from. Yes, there is that first level of Torah, the story, and you know, the, everything's written down for us as a text, but we're going much deeper here. We're saying, no, we're it's finding other forms of interpretation of this, of this text and giving it a much deeper meaning than it's given by just reading a text. Okay, Michael, it's your turn. Give us a topic. Well, sorry about that because I picked the same one that Dan picked, uh, which was the meditation in Genesis. Um, and so when I was talking about that before, that was what came to my mind. So I haven't got another one. I don't remember all the other titles. I mean, almost any of them can. Um, yeah, I wanted to do the Tree of Life because people who study Kabbalah from the basic basics will, that will be the first thing that you open up to. It's always on the cover, it's, you know, and, it, and people are very versed in the different elements of the tree of life. But let's see what Stan has to say about that. Um, show you something new, um, which is not fully developed yet either, but is really very interesting. For those of you who know something about the Kabbalah and about the Sefer Yetzir and the Sephardic tree, the tree of life in Kabbalah, if you take the two different seven color maps and peel off the two different spirals, this one goes around three times for one time through the hole, this one goes through the hole three times for one time around, and you put the two of them together, assuming that the same handedness, you get this form. The white line is from the bigger toroid, and the blue line is from the smaller one. In fact, the blue line is the same as this green line. When you put them together, they intersect. They weave, they interleave, just like you were making a basket. They intersect in 10 places. Those 10 intersections are the 10 spherot on the tree of life. And if you plug this model into the Sefi Yetzirah, and through Kabbalistic texts, all the relationships that are described on the tree of life are confirmable. You can see why they made the claim, why they connected this idea to that idea and this idea to that idea. I'm going to write it up, and that'll be another presentation. But this breaks open the whole idea of the tree of life. And for those of you who have studied the Lurianic Kabbalah, there's a discussion of the two circulations that come together to make the tree. For some reason, nobody seems to have made this model recently. I'm sure they did in the past. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'd like to add yeah. something here just as a comment. Sure, sure. That um, this particular lecture was in 19. Was that alphabet in our hands? Yeah, uh, part 90? two. Oh, 94. 94. Okay. He eventually did actually get around to specifically exploring. <laughs> Kabbal the Sefer Yetzira in terms of this kind of geometric analysis in 2016. Um, and it, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say with that is that he, um, it took that long 
for him to be able to integrate a lot of other learning and a lot of other material that he felt he could confidently then take Sefer Yitzira and actually explore it using the geometric framework um, that he had spent the last 20 years developing, polishing, protecting um, to come up with this. Um, it's yeah, he really wanted to translate the Sefer Yitzira. That was no, big desire. It's almost like Beethoven's Tenth Symphony. You know, it was like you get little pieces of it, but um, that 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 would you know, and no, it would have been a big, big, a long process to do that. All, uh, all we have is is his uh, graphic notes, which are incredibly dense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I should mention uh, at the beginning he's showing the the uh, Taurus and the seven color map, and we haven't really talked about that much. It's uh, it's on geometric metaphors of life where he introduces that. We should have brought it up when we were talking about Arthur Young because that's where he got that idea. It's a very powerful idea, and he uses that a lot in terms of describing how the uh, how the model uh, developed from that uh, the Taurus. Um, but any, any, any other comments on what we just saw? I mean, this is like a, this is like, um, you know, how like when you watch like a gymnast, you know, and they're doing those things on the floor and they're flipping and they're doing, you're like, oh, wow, that's, that's beautiful. And it looks kind of easy, you know, and then they get a 10.10. .10, you're like, wait, wh why was that better than the other one? They all kind of look this way. Like, this is like, like what he just did was connect Sefer Yitzira to Lurianic Kabbalah to like to like modern cosmology like this. It's like the that's what he just did. That's unbelievable. I mean, with the it's absolutely stunning what what he just talked about right there. That's that is like a, a just knowing anything or studying Kabbalah in any way and then looking and listening to that is uh, it's really really important actually. I had actually lot. forgotten about that particular connection. And also he, he, you know, like the Taurus basically is the shape of the universe in physics. And so he's making a lot of different connections. Adele? Yeah. I, I don't know whether Arthur Young did this, but taking the Taurus and then seeing the lines of movement sort of pulling out the negative lines or the positive lines and making the structure that no longer looked like a torus was like a skeleton mm -hmm. of the piece. That to me is blows my mind that someone would think, oh wait, let's look at what that looks like. And then to do it to for both models and see that the second model skeleton is different, mm -hmm. also elegant and different. Mm -hmm. And then to get to the point where you could say, oh, what would happen if we put these inside each other? 10, ten points connect. Mm -hmm. There's the sacred 10. So it's, um, <laughs> you know, we just look at it as his end moment, but the process of going through all of those uh, experiments, like let his mind would just, you know, see a structure so different. I mean, I just look at the thing going around and go, oh, pretty color is turning, you know, like I don't see that the seven is significant too. That's right. That's and right. so that there that he saw in the geometry uh, sacred forms. Mm -hmm. and, and the numbers and, and mean the seven something. color map was a movement. Again, he turns it, he turns it inside mm -hmm. out. It's not static. Um, right. And 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 the tense he wrote coming from that. I mean, you know, I, was there more written on that, Lavana? I'll have to look. There vaguely might be, but I'll have to look. Certainly nothing recent. Um, I want to go back to just as a comment on what Adele just said. Um, in terms of putting those the outlines of those two models together something that always helped him in terms of doing that is that he wasn't just doing it in his head it's he always 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 advocated that people physically make their own models not computer stuff 
make it with your hands. And, you know, he made that white model. He made that blue model. And at that point, you know, turning them around, you can go, oh, what happens if I weave these together, which is something that your fingers might want to do naturally anyway. So it was a, a back and forth between the intellect and the senses. Um, he always advocated that people actually make their own physical models in order to truly understand what was going on with the geometry. Um, and that's just a, a, you know, you can put it together, think about how do we actually learn things, and there are all kinds of theories of education of kids and all the rest of that, you know, involving the body is really essential in order to cement something. Um, and you can see that I'm using gestures. That's right. Yeah. I'm curious when I asked you about that, if he wrote anything and he identified the Sophia wrote based on those 10 points. Not based on those 10 points. And that's the kind of, that's the particular thing in terms of dealing with Sefer Yitzira and the model and the geometry that it took him that long to decide on. He, he, put aside studying the tree of life of all the other aspects of Kabbalah and Kabbalistic literature that he did study. He put aside the tree of life for a long time specifically because there were so many different versions of it in terms of the placement of the spherot and the identification of the spherot. And he felt that he had to come to a conclusion as to which one he was going to follow. And it took him that long, again, not thinking about it constantly, you know, letting it kind of mull in the back of his head to, to make some decisions on that, to be able to come up with what he eventually started to work with again in 2016. There are papers written in which he delves into the Sefer Yitzhira, his, his idea is good luck trying to interpret it. Um, <laughs> it's very complex, um, but Spence, it's there. Spence. And, yeah. you know, as he wrote, depending on who he was writing to, he assumed vocabulary, <laughs> um, which most of us would have to, you know, go to a Kabbalistic dictionary to look up um, or if a dictionary of math. If, if Stan had any Both. any fault, and it's, I shouldn't call it a fault, it was the fact that he assumed you knew more than you actually knew. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's he, he did that with his audiences. He he expected them to to grab these ideas. And you know, it, when you're a genius, you know, you expect other people to be a higher level than than most people are in their no, everyday you forget, life. You know, you forget it. It's like you it make is, assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> I will also say that that's it's a tech. I, he, I don't think he knew this, but that's actually a tech, a rabbinical technique. Um, what 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 differentiates oftentimes an advanced scholar in rabbinics versus a junior scholar is the junior scholar explains everything, everything, spells it all out, and the advanced scholar does not they leave a lot they they tell you but they expect you to either understand it or to work hard enough to to get to understand it yeah. and i've seen this over and over in in rabbinics and so it's very interesting he kind of you know he was an advanced scholar so that's what he did anyway yeah yeah, yeah he assumed that role and, yeah, he ex that. And, and yes he did expect people to do the work that they could do from their perspective of trying to, you know, try to understand first and then come with your good questions. And he'd be happy to respond to those good questions. But he did, you know, he was had very minimal patience with people who thought that he would just deliver them something on a silver platter That's right. and they wouldn't have to do any work. And people expected that sometimes. It was very yeah, frustrating. Really did. Well, we've gone way, way, way over time. Um, and I, I would like to continue this again next time because I think this is a great exercise and way to um, really flesh out a lot of this uh, material because we're going into areas where we haven't before. 
Um, and so I invite our audience to go to Extreme Kabbalah. Uh, if you want to offer suggestions or you can email me, uh, the address is at the end. Um, and we'll pick this up again uh, next time. For So for now, let's say thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.